I'm Tom Ray, and this is American Bandito. So what you're hearing right now is me modeling for a painting class. This must be a brief moment where I wasn't babbling like an idiot. Let, let me back up. So you may remember that I talked with an artist by the name of Philip Salamone. How are you doing so far, Tom? I'm good. Cool. And he had mentioned that he does a life painting class. He asked me if I wanted to actually model for one of the painting classes. Because in the show, we talked about how it would be interesting to be on the other side, to be the model for something that someone was going to paint or draw. So I told him I would do it. Here's the weird thing. I was actually really nervous going in. I mean, my job was to sit there and do nothing for five hours. And I was nervous. Like I sat down and I'm like, what do I do? Where do I go? And that's what I was supposed to do. Just sit there and have them paint me. Let me tell you a little something about what happened there. Thinking back after I left, I mean, it went fine, but you stare in one spot, and I was having conversations with the people that were painting. A lot of them have been around Madison for a long time, so I was able to relate with that. Then I found myself just talking. I just kept talking. I talked about growing up. I talked about me and my wife. I talked about things that I've done, things I want to do. It was like a therapy session. It was the oddest thing. Since I wasn't looking at them, I was looking at the wall across the room. Sometimes I just felt like I was just talking out loud to myself, thinking out loud. It was the strangest thing. Afterwards, of course, I felt very silly, but they said it was all right. I hope it was. I don't know. It was a very, very strange experience. And then another interesting thing happened. I actually just today spoke with someone from the Isthmus newspaper about the podcast. He was, he was talking to me about it and possibly going to write an interview about this show. So it was really cool to meet someone new, just somebody who heard the show and they were very interested and they wanted to know more about it. And what was really fun is that uh, I met him at a coffee shop and I bought my coffee with uh, some of the money that I made from modeling in Phil's painting session. Now today, I'm meeting a person that actually kind of does what I do. He has more of a cartoon, comic sort of style in his drawing. He takes it one further. He makes giant paintings of them. I think he references the story of Bosch, which I vaguely know. I know enough that it has something to do with, I think, heaven and hell. Kind of a biblical thing. It's something like that. And how he came to have a gallery showing called the Speech Balloon Narrative at the Arts and Literature Laboratory just this last year. So join me as I meet Colin Holden. Are you from Madison or around this area originally? I was born actually in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, but lived oh. there for about nine months with my parents. Then my dad got a job at the university here. So we moved here and I had my first birthday here. So pretty much I'm just from Madison. Spent a lot of my, to be totally honest, my uh, growing up experience was not especially awesome. I consider my my formative years, my coming into my own years, uh, to begin when I went to boarding school. Oh, you did? Got myself into boarding school in Iowa, a little Quaker school called really? Scattered Good Friends School right outside of Iowa City. And I went there in 89. I always told people that I got myself kicked out, but I got myself suspended, which was up for the last few weeks and decided not to come back. Okay. Came back to West High for my senior year, a very different person. For me, I've actually had conversations in which it is it is assumed that my becoming someone who was quiet, had a speech impediment, was not especially happy at home, into someone who could get kicked out of boarding school. It's mm -hmm. an awesome story. It is an awesome story. For college, I went to Cornell College in Iowa. Oh, so I spent a lot of time around Iowa City. I started taking art classes there in college, but more importantly, over these summers, I started taking art classes through a fellow named Scott Lesh. When did you actually start doing art? You know, you took it in college, but like you must have been doing it before that. It took me a long time. One of the things which is clear in my art, it, especially as it has matured, is that it's borrowed pretty freely from 
forms, from cartoons, from narrative art. Mm -hmm. And so I would consider my formation in art to, to start as soon as I am going to those sources and copying those cartoons. At that time, you know, being in middle school, being in, in, in early high school, copying early cartoons, I wouldn't have called it art at the time because I didn't know what it was going to become. Uh, we had these old comic books, Walt Kelly Pogo, copying sort of the nose, the way they did the eyes, mm -hmm. making my own cartoons. Now, was this I, in grade school when you did it or was it in high school? Yeah. This would have been in middle school or middle high school. school. Okay. What made you want to do that? Like, why did you start copying that, that art? Comics were definitely the first kinds of artistic expressions that seemed to have a full emotional range. And that's something that I still believe. Going yeah. to the transition between my doing more traditional art school, art in college, art, to really embracing cartoons, the thing that really did it for me was recognizing that if you someone could have more emotional resonance with a cartoon than they could with a realistically depicted person. I think that's true. In one of my early, early works, I do a sort of a, a, a cartoony anatomized skeleton with the idea that there's actually something more distressing about seeing this anatomized cartoon than you would if I were to do something hyper-realistic, which you could, in fact, separate yourself from mentally. Mm -hmm. No, actually, this goes way back. Hmm. I think I, I had a sense that I wanted to be a cartoonist from grade school. I would say Pogo was the first cartoon that I could render accurately, and someone would say, oh, that's Pogo. Okay. But I also know that going back to grade school, I would take the stories that I depicted in, say, Tintin comics, Okay, um, if you remember those, uh -huh. and I would depict them, and it's only if you knew the story that you could say, oh, this little figure is going through all of the steps that Tintin does in Explorers on the Moon, where he goes into a cave and discovers ice. You no, know, spoiler alert, they discover ice in Tintin on the Moon. Uh, I think it was written before humans had actually been on the moon. So I hadn't, I hadn't actually thought of this. These were things that I was probably doing in second grade. Mm -hmm. And you're activating pretty old parts of my brain that I didn't think I would. <laughs> I really come into my own when I go back to that well of comics and narrative art. And that's something that I really recognized the power of and wanted to copy in some way, mm -hmm. both in the story structure and, and in the style since early on. On your website, you've done paintings and other things like that. What would you say is the uh, medium that you use the most? I am actually switching mediums. So oh. what you will find for almost all of the are done in colored pencil. And I'm actually pretty flattered that people have seen it as being like, there's a thickness to it. Yeah. And because of the cartoony style, people will often see it as pen. The reason why I am, I am currently experimenting with pen. And part of the reason why it took me a while was because even though there's not a lot of flexibility when you're working with colored pencil, there's enough that you can correct and change. These are very large works. I generally use the largest uh, dimension I poster board in, near five feet tall or five feet wide. You were, were working yes. with five feet tall, so tell me more about that. Yes, I think my my artistic style was perhaps the product of a temporary clerical error with a framing supplies warehouse. Okay. So at a certain time, I was working on poster board, but I was not someone who could easily shell out 50 bucks for one piece of acid-free poster board easily. Mm -hmm. And when you put a mark on something and you don't like what's there, you used it. And so I thought, I need to shell out the money for as much as I can. And was asking around with my friends that they recommended a supplier called Vicky Schober and Associates. From 2000 to 2002, Vicky Schober and Associates shipped 
the largest pieces you, of poster board you can ship to my house. You can't do that anymore. You need a retailer's number in order to buy directly from them. So this isn't really a plug from them, offer them unless you're a retailer. My idea at first was that this was just the most efficient way to get a whole bunch of poster board and I was going to cut it into smaller pieces. But as soon as I saw that size, there was something, I don't know, there was something about it that seemed to suggest five feet tall is just large enough to take up your full field of vision. I couldn't really tell you why, but there was something about it that caused me to not chop it up. When it comes to telling a story over over a visual field, medieval and late a medieval art also had had a very had a strong knack for having a set of panels in which things are going on. I think my first paneled piece, it tells the story of but it depicts aliens coming with gifts skeletons building a city then the city falls down uh, the skeletons are babies at first but then they grow up this is just something happened at this point where these stories and images started to come i always had a sense that if i could get this flow of images and a little ideas that that could be part of what i drew uh, because i i love the style and the narrative structure of comic art, but I'm also a big fan of extremely busy late medieval, especially like Bosch comes to mind. Okay. Uh, but it's, you know, in the garden of earthly delights in, in the middle, there's just so much that's going on that it takes time to focus on what's going on here. What's going on here. Yeah. Um, this doesn't really answer the question of, why this all came to me when I was thinking five feet tall. But once I figured that I could actually do it, it became both a, this is a cliche, but a blessing and a curse. I will go through periods in which I will finish one of these larger pieces. They mm -hmm. take a while. They always involve some sort of a crisis. And nothing is coming to mind as far as what's going to be on the ground, what's going to be in the sky. But whenever I pull it off, I have to admit that I do pull it off. Okay. <laughs> how did you get stuff out there? Like, where were you selling things and how, how did you um, go about that? I've actually been fortunate at fortunate enough to be pretty busy and out there over this past year. How so? Um, Arts and Literature Laboratory opened, which is a, an artistic art and music and writing space on the Near East Side, very close to where I live. And I dropped in and I really liked the idea. I knew it was very sympathetic to writing and poetry. I really, I'm, I'm also a big fan of contemporary poets and poetry. I started talking about the idea of getting a couple other artists together uh, to have a joint show. There's a, uh, there's an artist, he lives in Fort Atkinson, I believe, named Jeremy Pink, or he'll go by a uh, Gazo Pink sometimes. Mm -hmm. And he does large paintings that they're not narrative in that there's not a structure that flows through a story, but they definitely draw from a well of pop culture and cartoons. And this um, is the speech balloon uh, narrative and art yes, projects thing? Okay. Yes. I reached out to him about doing that maybe, good Lord, it could have been up to a year before it actually happened. And he invited me to be part of a, a pop-up show on the top floor of the Madison Public Library earlier that year. It was basically to show off some of your initial drawings. And last year was unusual because it's only relatively recently that I've gotten over just the technical burden of having five foot tall pieces. To put <laughs> <out>. <laughs> right. <See? laughs> you can't frame them traditionally. Whenever I sold a piece maybe more than a year ago now, and I did kind of feel bad because I knew what was involved in framing it. Took it to Monroe Street Framing. I am almost certain paid more for the framing than for the piece. I can't do that just to display the things. Mm -hmm. I had a carpenter friend. I just put together these basic frames uh, that I can 
remove the pieces, you know, take the pieces in and out of. But that's been a pretty recent. I think I only fully had frames to show everything maybe two or three years ago. Okay. That's about right. Yeah. It, yeah, it makes sense. That would be that would be tough. Have you ever thought of just uh, mm-hmm. learning how to make the frames yourself instead of taking them somewhere? Uh, one of the disadvantages of not having gone through a full artist program, I don't necessarily feel feel handy. I feel okay, okay. asking someone else to put together those those makeshift frames. Yeah. Uh, and how did you guys uh, promote the gallery show? So, I mean, I'm assuming it was a good turnout. Like what, what sort of methods did you yeah. use to promote a gallery show? Honestly, I think that making it a joint show in which each individual had their own following was pretty key. It's a very word of mouth community. At least uh, that's certainly what I found. Uh, those artistic events they acknowledge that each of these individual artists has their own network and you bring them together, mm-hmm. then you're going to have more people show up. You don't know if you guys did any actual, like, say, advertising or uh, Facebook oh, posts oh, or anything? Like- Arts and Literature Laboratory was great for using their own social media channels. And I think they also put together a press release, oh, okay. which, to be honest, is something that, uh, that in my experience, artists in Madison are not as practiced in using. I think that if you can put together a confident looking press release that this is going to be an actual event, you can definitely uh, get a mention, get your uh, your information out there. Arts and Literature Laboratory has, has done a great job of discovering and I think that they are an actual celebration and an amplification of a lot of the art and music that's in that's in Madison. What would you say would keep you from doing this full time and why not? What what are your plans moving forward to just try and get yourself out there more or do things? I am looking right now at galleries in Milwaukee. I oh, think that cool. our shows in Madison were really well received. But I also feel that I think it's important to just be seen by more people. And that's something that I think I've, I've held off on for a while. I think that there are structural problems just with hanging this, uh, this many large pieces. I have a certain fear that uh, depending on those, those images for my livelihood. I, I certainly can't look at my own work and say and look at the fact that I'm still making work at my age and justify that fear. Okay. But it is definitely one that is that is out there is is a fear that the next idea won't come. Okay. So it's not necessarily the fact that it's the piece itself that you don't want to give up because then you won't own it anymore. But it's the putting it out there because because no. what I was getting from that is you were saying that like these pieces, you couldn't really let them go. No, I am. I am very pleased knowing that there are pieces of mine in Chicago, in Boston okay. that are receiving some sort of love. So mm-hmm. that is actually what I want the most. It's taken some time for me to really get a sense that I have enough to show and a sense that this is my personality and this is my voice. I've mentioned that I had a speech impediment. I had a pretty severe speech impediment. I did not have a, I, I didn't have a home situation that was, I think it's fair to say that my experience being at home was primarily one of fear and avoiding anger and the the ideal situation to for me to experience was some sort of benign neglect. So my first experience with a lot of these cartoons, with a lot of these focusing on pogo cartoons, writing up a story, copying what I saw in these comic books, a lot of that came from my creating a very private space yeah. and, and a space that wasn't necessarily going to be celebrated if I brought it to anyone. Okay. Um, that makes it kind of interesting that I kept it going 
And I'm proud of myself for keeping it going. I'm very proud of myself for becoming the person I am from that. But it means that a lot of the connections between what you make and other people are going to be, I don't want to say severed, but not created early on. It, that I'm, I'm very conscious that there's a very private space that this artistic, in, in which this artistic creation goes on. A lot of these images and stories seem to be primarily or first for me, about me. And it's taken some time for me to recognize that these are things that are, uh, that I can s- s- safely show to other people, if that's all right to say. Yeah. I take time to create a space either within my own home for silence and meditation. Okay. I aim for 20 minutes of that a day. That's something that's uh, that's more recent because I was going through a period of the images not coming to mind. There's a retreat space. There's the Holy Wisdom Monastery, which is a monastery up on the far north side, really? which is run by a group of nuns who have split from the Catholic church. They, you Hmm. can just rent retreat space there. I'll, I'll go there and do silent retreats. I've had, you know, just for myself and they'll have meals. The meals are excellent by the way, but I'll just have, you know, a little room as if you were a visiting seminarian, you know, because the whole structure was built way back when the monastery was connected with the Catholic Church. So huh. it's old style dorms. Yeah. I'd never heard of would, that. Huh. That's yeah. interesting. Yeah, I would I I would recommend it. I just it is hard to find those moments of silence because it's not even reflection. You just have to leave your mind open for having the courage. One thing that I have found is when I'm doing comic art, it really does change when you enlarge it or shrink it. It reminds me of, uh, do you remember Shrinky Dinks? Some of you may, some of you may not. They were just large pieces of plastic. Then you put them in the oven and they would shrink down and you'd look at them and for some reason it would be cooler. I don't know why. It just was. It was just the way it would shrink down and it would just look cooler. I can't explain it any other way. It's, it was the same drawing. Nothing changed except the size. Just something I kind of noticed. That happens also with the medium that you do it on. If I print something or if I put it on the web, sometimes it looks better when I'm looking at it on my phone. Sometimes it looks better when I print it on a nice piece of paper. Different mediums. If I'm not mistaken, Salvador Dali, when you actually see his real paintings, they're like postcard size. Or I could be completely wrong. Should have looked that up first. I want to thank Colin for talking with me today. And don't forget, if you're just hearing the show for the first time, you can learn more about it at AmericanBandito.com, where you can read my daily comic journal called Then This Happened at AmericanBandito.com slash comic. The music for the show is provided by Romcom. That's com with two M's. And you can learn more at AmericanBandito.com slash music. So thank you for listening, and if you want to hear more, you can subscribe on your iPhone at Apple Podcasts, or if you're an Android user, you can subscribe on Google Play. Or if you want, you can subscribe to the show on YouTube at youtube.com slash Tom Ray. I meet another person next week. Until then, so long.